Welcome, everyone, and uh, thanks for joining us today for 12 Treacherous Tribulations. Thanks to Avemco for sponsoring this series of webinars, and also to my colleague, Elaine Lisser, who is engineering today and also monitoring the chat. To those of you watching the live stream on YouTube, uh, thanks for joining these, us, but I do apologize. We're unable to respond to comments posted on YouTube while we're live. There's just uh, not enough of us <laughs> and not enough hands to, uh, to make that all, all work. So uh, moving along, in case you didn't know, Avemco is a sponsor of the FAST team, and uh, they pay for the wings that you receive when you uh, complete a phase of wings, so lapel pins or hat pins or, you know, whatever they are, the little wing sets. And at the end of this presentation, I'll tell you how you might be eligible for a discount and your aircraft insurance for attending this webinar, so stay tuned. Start with just a bit of housekeeping. In the live seminars, we always tell you where the exits are and where the bathrooms are. Well, I'll leave that up to you to figure that out since you're not here. Uh, our emergency would be some sort of a system crash on my end. It's unlikely, but um, it can possibly happen. If it does, check your email. and uh, We'll let you know when we're going to reschedule. And also, uh, vectorsforsafety.com, I will post a reschedule time there. But let's uh, cross our fingers and hope for the best and move on from there. For the benefit of those who have not participated in any of my events previously, I'll uh, provide a really brief introduction. I've been involved in aviation my whole life. Took my official flying lesson, first official flying lesson, age 14. Sold on my 16th birthday, and that was in 1962, a long time ago. I had a great career, for which I am very, very, very thankful. I have flown everything from jets to cubs, but flight instructing was always my preferred activity, except it was pretty dangerous because you might starve to death if you relied on that. I've given more than 8,000 hours of dual instruction. I've continued with my psychology background to do work in human factors. For five years, I was on the safety committee of the NBAA. I was their human factors person. I was on the fitness for duty working group. I was also an annual presenter at the NBAA convention, and today I do speaking engagements, uh, mainly virtual right now with everything going on, and I do consulting and error reduction for a number of industries, not just aviation. So let me stop my video so you don't have to be looking at me as we're going along. There we go, and we'll just look at our, at our screen here. Uh, what do we want to accomplish today? Well, we want to recognize the importance of human factors in accident prevention. We want to attain an awareness of the 12 most common human error causal factors. And we want to apply the understanding of human factors to personal and business aviation. All right, the serious beginning of human factors applications in aviation was precipitated by the crash of an American Airlines DC-10 at Chicago's O'Hare Airport in 1979. It remains the worst aviation accident, accident that is, to ever occur on U.S. soil other than the terror events of September 11, 2001, which of course were not accidents. Uh, shown here are some news photos from the day of the crash. Note the missing number one engine on that uh, DC-10. Uh, the failure of an engine pylon is what caused the accident. We'll talk more about that later. Maintenance personnel had failed to follow approved procedures for changing the number one engine. And this happened weeks before the actual accident and uh, caused damage to the pylon. Now we go back 26 months prior to that accident. March 1977. Two Boeing 747s collided on the runway at Tenerife in the Canary Islands. This accident remains the worst aviation disaster in history anywhere with 583 total fatalities. The photo on the left is a simulation and the photo on the right is a news photo. Now KLM Chief Pilot uh, Captain Van Zanden, Chief Pilot Captain Van Zanden became impatient and initiated takeoff without ATC clearance. The issue was duty time. He felt pressure to get airborne so the flight wouldn't have to be canceled. Up until that time, he was considered a superb pilot and had been featured in ads for KLM like the one shown on this slide. Now, both the American Airlines DC-10 crash and the Pan Am KLM collision were clearly the result of human error. Today, 
Airline maintenance and flight operations treat human factors as a first priority. General aviation has been a bit slow to catch up, though we're now recognizing that most uh, GA, uh, serious GA accidents result from human error, and we're taking steps to address that. We are getting better, uh, much better at that. Now, I don't believe in taking a lot of valuable presentation time to establish a lengthy background, but I think in this case, we need to see the big picture of error reduction. Fewer errors, it's simple. It means fewer accidents. All right, these 12 treacherous tribulations. These were originally laid out by a man named Gordon DuPont, and he was employed by uh, Transport Canada. He did this in 1993. He applied them to errors made while performing aircraft maintenance, and he named them the Dirty Dozen. Now, anybody who has ever been involved in aircraft maintenance has undoubtedly had some training on the Dirty Dozen. Now, I don't know if I can take credit for being the first, but in 2002, I modified the concept to apply to uh, flight operations for pilots and renamed it as 12 Treacherous Tribulations. But it's all Gordon DuPont's work, and um, he's a great guy, and we thank him for that. Now, these 12 factors are responsible for nearly all human error. Let me say that again. These 12 factors are responsible for nearly all human error, and they apply to all activities, not just aviation. These provide a starting point for an error reduction program for any industry. But just because we understand these concepts does not mean that we will always follow them. After all, what are we? We're human, and sometimes our humanness just gets in the way. We also need to understand how our brains work when making decisions and what unconscious influences are also at work. So for the next step in being safer, register for our free webinar coming up on June 4th called Better Decision Making. Uh, you can find a registration uh, link for that on uh, vectorsforsafety.com under the Pilot Talk tab but that will follow up what we're doing here today. So let's proceed. I'm gonna present each of these 12 items, but in no particular order, it's not going from most important to least important or most common to cause accidents to least common to cause accidents, uh, totally at random order. First factor we're going to talk about is a lack of communication. Research shows that only about 30% of verbal com uh, communication is received and understood by either side in a conversation. Or we can say that we hear or read what we expect to hear or read rather than what's actually presented. So it's not just verbal, it's written also. We only, uh, we only get about 30%, either side only gets about 30% of what's there. And now what we're going to do for a format today is we're going to talk about one of these, and then we're going to go right into an accident that may or may not illustrate what we're talking about, okay? These are, these are tough, and, and you never find the NTSB, or well, you rarely find the NTSB blaming one of these factors specifically. But we can draw some conclusions, and they're examples, and they may not be totally accurate in terms of the cost. Anyway, uh, here's our first example. This accident is representative of many gear up landing accidents that happen every year, and I'll tell you what, there are a lot of them, okay? It occurred during a flight review and it was a result of a lack of communication between the flight instructor and the pilot under instruction. Nobody got hurt in this one, but a lot of dollars change hands when something like this happens. Uh, during the in-flight portion of the flight review, the private pilot, who did not have a current flight review at the time of the accident, forgot to extend the landing gear during a practice sort, uh, soft field landing. The flight instructor, who was giving the flight review, was aware that the pilot had not put the gear down. While the aircraft was on final approach, he told the pilot multiple times to execute a go around. The pilot, who said he did not hear the command to go around, landed the aircraft with, guess what, the gear up. The flight instructor thought the pilot had heard him and that he was going to do a go around, and he therefore did not take remedial action to ensure the aircraft did not land with its gear up. And by the way, nobody used a checklist. Now, the NTSB stated the probable, probable cause as, the pilot's failure to extend the landing gear prior to a practice soft field landing and the certified flight instructor's failure to take remedial action. Factors include the pilot's failure to use a checklist, end of quote. But the real cause was the lack of communication between the instructor and the pilot under instruction. 
So let's look at some recommendations. Whenever flying with another pilot, it's a good idea to have a, a discussion and set the ground rules before the flight. The discussion should include a clear understanding of who is pilot in command, the procedure for exchange of flight controls, and a means of acknowledging instructions given by the pilot in command. In this case, if a means of acknowledging instructions had been established, the instructor would have been aware that the pilot under instruction was not aware of the command to go around. Next factor I want to address is uh, complacency. Even complex tasks can become routine over time. We may lose awareness of the importance of the task and the risk of making an error while performing the task. We may see what we want to see or expect to see and miss important signals. It's very easy to become complacent about things that we, we do, but that they always check out okay. Uh, do you ops check the brake lights on your car? How many do that? I won't take the time now because we have a lot of material today, but I have a story about that. And uh, I do ops check the brake lights on my car. There's a reason for it. All right, the associated accident with complacency is this. Um, <clears throat> the twin engine airplane, uh, Piper Navajo there, as you see, uh, was on a part 135 charter flight. It was destroyed by impact with terrain about two and a half miles northeast of the airport while returning to the airport with an engine problem. A witness reported that the pilot arrived for the flight and was not in the office for more than two minutes when he grabbed the status book, walked straight to the airplane, and boarded. Alignment serviced both engines with oil, but failed to put the dipstick back in the right engine oil filler tube. Witnesses reported that they, they did not see the pilot perform a pre-flight. The pilot was unaware that the dipstick was left on the right wing of the airplane. The pilot taxied the airplane forward about five feet and abruptly stopped and shut down both engines. The pilot got out of the airplane. The lineman reported that he approached the pilot and asked what was wrong. The lineman reported that the pilot closed the oil flap door on the right engine and said that the oil flap door had been left open. The pilot restarted the engines and departed. About three minutes after takeoff, the pilot informed departure control that he needed to return to the airport due to, guess what, an oil leak. A witness located about a quarter mile from the accident site observed the airplane flying, quote, really low, unquote. He reported, quote, the motor on the plane wasn't cutting out or sputtering, unquote. Another witness reported, quote, the plane lifted up over power lines, then went across the field about 50 to 80 feet off the ground, unquote. The airplane impacted a harvested cornfield in a steep nose-down attitude and traveled only 45 feet before stopping. The inspection of the airplane revealed that the landing gear was down, flaps were in the 20-degree uh, down position, neither prop was feathered. The NTSB determined the probable cause of the accident as follows, quote, the pilot's failure to pre-flight the airplane, the pilot's improper in-flight decision not to land the airplane on the runway when he had the opportunity, and the inadvertent stall when the pilot allowed the airspeed to get too low. Factors that contributed to the accident were the lineman's improper serving of the, servicing of the airplane when he left the oil dipstick out and the subsequent oil leak, unquote. Again, we can become complacent if we perform a pre-flight 200 times and we don't find anything. But maybe that 201st time will be when something is wrong. So as a remedy, we need to train ourselves to question everything, not just in aviation, but in everything and develop a pattern of questioning, and that can go a long way to preventing complacency. And of course, you know the old thing about assume. Well, guess what? Never assume. That was an interesting accident in that the pilot <laughs> saw the oil flap door open. He shut the airplane down, he got out, and he, he closed the oil flap, but it, you know he never looked to see if the, if the dipstick was in there. Didn't you kind of assume that if the oil flap, uh, oil door was, open, maybe somebody hadn't put the dipstick back, I don't know, anyway, complacency. All right, let's talk about lack of knowledge next. We might be uh, missing a piece of knowledge when performing a task. We don't always know what we don't know, so we may not know that we're missing that piece of knowledge. This accident, uh, the pilot started the airplane and the, uh, I'm back up here. <laughs> 
The pilot stated that the airplane battery was dead, and he used an external source to charge start the airplane. The taxi and initial takeoff were uneventful. During the landing gear retraction after takeoff, the airplane lost total electrical power. The pilot elected to continue the flight and troubleshoot the electrical failure. With no electrical power, the pilot had no communications and had to manually extend the landing gear. A second airplane flew near the accident airplane to help verify that the landing gear was extended. And I don't know how they were communicating if he didn't have any electrical power and any radios, but that's what the report says. The landing gear appeared to be extended and the pilot attempted to land the airplane. During the landing roll, the right main landing gear collapsed. Airplane went off the runway. The right wing impacted a runway sign, nose landing gear and left main landing gear collapsed. Airplane came to rest upright approximately 10 feet off the runway. An examination of the airplane showed that the aircraft battery was completely discharged. Now the owner of the airplane, who was not the pilot, reported that the alternator would not be able to handle the electrical load during the landing gear retraction without battery power. The NTSB determined the probable cause. The pilot's, quote, the pilot's improper decision to fly the airplane with a discharged battery, which resulted in a total electrical failure during takeoff and climb. Contributing factors were the pilot's inability to verify the landing gear position and the impact with the runway sign. That's the end of their quote from that. Clearly, the pilot didn't have knowledge of the high power requirement of the electrically operated landing gear system. Sometimes we don't know what we don't know. This, uh, there's no foolproof remedy for lack of knowledge, but if we try to learn all we can about whatever we're doing, we certainly decrease the likelihood that we'll make an error based on lack of knowledge. Now, personally, in the airplane I fly, I try to learn all I can about the systems in the airplane uh, before I fly it. There's, there's been so many times that something has happened when I've been flying, not necessarily an emergency, but something that I didn't expect. And if I, if, if I understood the systems, I could often figure out what might have caused that before I went and did something uh, not good. All right, um, Lane, do you have anybody, um, any comments or questions that we need to look at before we continue on here? Well, William Theobald has his hand up and I just uh, sent him a message saying if he would put his question over in the chat that I would get it to you. But oh, actually, I, I let me uh, open William's microphone if we can, or actually I think we decided we weren't gonna do those, didn't we? So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think on the last webinar, we had decided that we weren't going to open microphones because there'd been a problem on a previous one, apparently. And um, so we'll put it over in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll get to them. So, okay. Uh, thank you, Lane. Sorry about that. We'll go on from there. Um, before we continue on, let me just uh, remind everybody of an outstanding presentation that's coming on May 28th. A fellow FAST team rep from Montana, Kurt uh, Kleiner, is a mountain flying enthusiast, and he's gonna share his knowledge of mountain waves with us. Now, Avemco is the sponsor, and I will serve as the host, and Lane will monitor the chat for us, just like what we're doing today. So uh, to register for that webinar, visit vectorsforsafety.com, go to the pilot talk section, and there's a registration link there, but that's uh, that should be an outstanding event. Gene? Yes, sir. I can interrupt you really quickly. William threw his question up there. He said, how did he get the engine started with a dead battery, or did he miss something? Oh, he jump-started it. Um, he had jumper cables, and he got the, uh, you know, used jumper cables to start the engine, but, of course, the battery was, was discharged, so the alternator uh, could not keep up. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. And um, I confess to have done that before. I confessed in 172s and things, but they... You know, they don't have retractable landing gear, so it, the alternator does catch up. But I've since learned that it's just not a really good idea to fly with a dead, with a dead battery, hoping that the alternator will catch up and get things go posted. Along that line, there was another accident when the, um, oh, the twin engine, oh, it's escaping me now. They're building London, Ontario. Um, um, oh, dear. Anyway, there's a, a twin engine airplane came out. And it was very high tech, and it was a very electric airplane, and um, it had what they call FADEX, full authority digital engine control on it. And it was a similar situation. The battery was very low in the airplane. Somehow they got the airplane started. But when they retracted the, the landing gear after takeoff, both engines quit. 
because the electronic digital engine controls all of a sudden became unpowered and that was the end of that. The engines just uh, completely shut down. So not a good idea to, um, for a DA-42, Diamond was the other one, right? DA-42 was a twin and uh, I don't know if they've done anything to prevent that or not, but uh, not a good idea to fly with your batteries completely flat on you. All right, next factor is distraction. Distraction is anything that draws attention away from the immediate task. Distraction can result in a momentary loss of situational awareness. Now, um, I need to, uh, there we go. I need to fix something there. All right, uh, this distraction example is a classic case of something coming unlatched. And there have been so, so many accidents in general aviation where something was unlatched and it ended you know, something very serious. I've written this issue, written about this many, many times. All right, anyway, the airplane involved was a Cessna Citation. No airplane type nor pilot experience level has a lock on this kind of accident. In this case, line personnel reported that as the airplane was being fueled, the second pilot loaded more than one bag in the left front baggage compartment. Now, when the fueling was complete, line personnel saw the second pilot pull the left front baggage door down, but not lock or latch it. Now, the runway was about 8,000 feet long, and the witness near midfield reported that the airplane was airborne during the takeoff, and the front uh, left baggage door was closed. But witnesses near the end of the runway reported that the airplane was about 200 feet above the ground, and they noted that the left baggage door was open and standing straight up. Now, all the witnesses reported that the airplane turned slightly left, leveled off, and was slow. The airplane began to descend, and the wings were slightly rocking before it stalled, broke right, and collided with terrain. The NTSB determined the probable cause as follows, quote, the pilot's failure to maintain an adequate airspeed during the initial climb resulting in an inadvertent stall spin, contributing to the accident with the second pilot's inadequate pre-flight, failure to properly secure the front baggage door and the, left, and the front left baggage door opening in flight, which likely distracted the first pilot, end quote. We've all heard it before. Whatever is going on, whatever the problem is, fly the airplane. And here's a case where a professional flight crew allowed a distraction to cause a fatal accident. So none of us are immune from this. No matter how much experience we have, a distraction, a problem, focus on flying the airplane. All right, next thing we'll talk about is teamwork or more precisely a lack thereof. Most tasks that we do involve some level of teamwork somehow. Now, errors occur when somebody mistakenly assumes that someone else has performed some part of a task. In this example, the team consisted of two pilots and an air traffic controller. A Piper PA-28-180 and a Cessna 210 collided in flight over Florida, Bradfordville, Florida. And miraculously, because <laughs> this isn't usually the case in a mid-air collision, nobody got hurt. The pilot of the Piper aircraft, was which was transmitting mode C transponder data the entire time it was under radar service at Tallahassee ATC, was advised by the controller to turn to a heading of 090 degrees. At the time, the flight was located approximately 12 miles north of Tallahassee, which was the intended destination airport. Now, approximately one minute later, the same controller assigned the pilot of the Cessna not transmitting mode C data, a heading of 090 degrees, as he was uh, climbing out from an airport located just north of Tallahassee. Radar data indicates that the controller subsequently put the two aircraft on converging flight paths. The controller then instructed the pilot, uh, pilot of the Piper to descend to 3,000 feet and turn to a heading of 120 degrees. Shortly after these instructions were given, the pilot of the Cessna stated to the controller that he had just had a mid-air collision with another aircraft. Both aircraft landed at Tallahassee without further incident. Both pilots later reported that they did not see the other before or at the time of impact. The controller did not provide traffic advisories or safety alerts required in Class C airspace to either aircraft before the collision. The NTSB uh, determined the probable cause, quote, the failure of ATC to provide traffic advisories and safety alerts required in Class C airspace 
and the inability of both pilots to see and avoid each other, parenthesis, low wing on top, high wing below, close parenthesis, resulting in the midair collision, end quote. Pilots and controllers make up a team. Now, in this case, all team members failed to adequately do their jobs, and the teamwork broke down. What's the job of the two pilots? See and avoid. Job of the controller, provide the traffic advisories. It broke down. Now, at times, we must rely on others. But whenever possible, keep in mind that the other person might slip up. As Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. Now, lack of awareness is our next factor. Anyone who does not recognize the consequences of an action suffers from a lack of awareness. It's different than lack of knowledge. Experienced people are actually more likely to make lack of awareness errors. Let me say that again. Experienced people are actually more likely to make lack of awareness errors. Experienced people have, have been there a lot, and they're more likely to think they're, they have better awareness, they know it all, and it uh, doesn't always work that way. Our example accident uh, was a double fatal, unfortunately. An amateur-built uh, RV-10 was destroyed when it impacted trees and terrain in Alabama. The instrument-rated private pilot requested a VOR approach into the airport. Thereafter, he began a descent from cruise flight into instrument meteorological conditions. The controller cleared the airplane for the approach about 20 miles north of the airport. The airplane then, then began a descending right turn, and the pilot requested and was provided vectors to another airport. While en route to that airport, he amended his request and asked for vectors to a third airport, stating that he required an airport with an ILS approach. The controller subsequently provided vectors, followed by an ILS approach clearance. Shortly after receiving the clearance, the pilot flew past the ILS localizer path and the controller canceled the approach clearance. The pilot then requested an airport with cloud bases 2,000 feet or better. The controller advised him to check the weather at a nearby airport. The airplane then began a rapid descending right turn, followed by a steep climbing right turn. The airplane deviated approximately 400 feet above its assigned altitude and 1,200 feet below on multiple occasions throughout the last 14 minutes of the flight. The controller twice relayed low altitude alert warnings to the pilot and on five occasions alerted him that he was not maintaining the assigned heading. The pilot did not declare an emergency to the controller at any point during their communication. Now the airplane was equipped with a glass cockpit. The NTSB probable cause finding stated, quote, the pilot in command's in-flight loss of control due to spatial disorientation, contributing to the accident with the weather condition and the pilot in command's lack of flight experience in the accident airplane. Now, the pilot was obviously not comfortable with the use of the glass cockpit in actual IFR. He was not aware of the proper means of using the equipment and was probably not aware that he was not aware goes back to we don't know what we don't know, right? Now here's some recommendations to help avoid lack of awareness accidents. Take the time to become thoroughly familiar with all the equipment in the airplane. Participate in recurrent training. Let me say that um, the importance of recurrent training, we just can't overstate that. If a pilot feels that it is necessary, then just remember that we don't know what we don't know. Um, Recurrent training is, is just really critical, and it doesn't mean you have to enroll in a you know a big expensive course at some big flight school. Get an instructor that you trust, that's competent, go out and just do some stuff. Guarantee you'll learn stuff. All right, next factor is fatigue. There's presently lots of interest in fatigue as a causal factor in all sorts of errors and accidents. It's really a hot topic right now. Now, much research is still being done, and new info is coming out fairly frequently. Effects of fatigue resemble effects of being under the influence of alcohol. There are all kinds of statistics and numbers to go with it, but we don't have time to go into those today. But fa uh, fatigue may not be recognized until we reach an extreme level of it. Okay? Others may see it before we do, but we may, may not be self-aware of it. Here's an example. After completing a 16-hour shift at work, let me back up on that one. I'll say it again, after completing a 16-hour shift at work, 
the pilot flew the airplane for a local flight. Radar data showed the airplane depart to the north and execute a series of maneuvers approximately 25 miles north of the departure airport before radar contact was lost. The pilot was likely fatigued, though the investigation was unable to establish that the pilot's fatigue played a role in the accident. The NTSB uh, returned, determined the probable cause as follows, quote, the pilot's failure to maintain aircraft control for undetermined reasons, unquote. Of course, we can't know for sure that fatigue was a causal factor here, so the NTSB can't list it as such, but it seems very likely that fatigue at least contributed in some way uh, toward this accident. So what do we do about it? Since we're often the last to know that we're fatigued, be aware of the disruption of normal sleep cycles. Uh, be aware that fatigue might be present if we do that. Uh, take a 20-minute nap before flying, if you can. I mean, we can't always do that, of course, but uh, research indicates that 20 minutes is a magic number for a nap. A longer nap might result in being uh, groggy when you woke up. Ever been in um, an FBO that caters to corporate or business aviation? Go in the flight ops section. What do you see there? Some nice, comfortable recliners, often with a pillow, a blanket on them, and a, um, you know, a um, headset so you can listen to some music or at least not listen to the outside world, get a short nap. Uh, very, very, very effective. All right, let's go into lack of resources. This appears to be an increasingly common um, causal factor of accidents, uh, maybe because the cost of flying continues to escalate. I fear that it may become even a bigger problem as the economic effects of this pandemic are realized. Who knows? Lack of resources may refer to specific items not being available, parts, tools, charts, and so on. It may also refer to a general lack of financial resources for equipment, materials, or training. Lack of resources may cause us to improvise and cause an error. Uh, this is a big factor in aircraft maintenance, you know, using, you know, we don't have quite the right spark plug, so well, these will work, you know, kind of thing, or uh, all those sorts of things that we don't have quite the right part, but this one should be okay, we'll put it on. Uh, those are, those can be problems. Here's one that, you know, may or may not be lack of resources, but um, um, there's a good chance it is. The cross-country flight departed Minden, Louisiana. It was en route to Gilmer, Texas at the time the accident occurred. The pilot had recently purchased the airplane. There were no signs of fuel, fuel spillage uh, in the surrounding soil at the accident scene except for a stain about the size of a plate under the engine assembly. The fuel tank was empty. Gas collator contained two to three tablespoons of fuel. No witnesses to the accident. An examination of the airframe and the engine revealed no anomalies. But a non-aviation intended, uh, non-aviation GPS that was intended for hiking uh, was found on board, and it recorded the last few minutes of the flight. It depicted 10 separate course reversals over the uh, accident area prior to the accident. The airplane was 20 miles south of its intended fuel stop. A sectional chart with notations regarding courses, distances, and intended fuel stops was recovered from the wreckage. The NTSB returned, determined the probable cause to be a loss of engine power due to fuel exhaustion as a result of the pilot's improper fuel planning. Contributing to the accident was the pilot's failure to maintain situational awareness, resulting in him being lost. That's the end of their quote on that. Now, the pilot was probably not proficient in doing pilotage cross-country flights, you know, just looking out the, out the window with a chart. There were no other NAV radios of any kind in the airplane. So possibly, the pilot bought this aircraft uh, due to a low cost, and then he didn't spend the money for an aviation GPS. Now, whether or not he had the funds available for proper equipment isn't known, but apparently a lack of resources or at least excessive frugality played a role in this accident. We could talk about all kinds of overconfidence, whatever, but uh, we went out on a fairly lengthy flight, uh, just trying to rely on a, you know, a bargain store GPS that uh, just was not was not sufficient. Okay. Next is pressure. Pressure can negatively influence our decision regarding maintenance or flying. Demands can come from a variety of sources, but most pressure is self-induced. 
Individuals can often take ownership of something that is not their own doing. It's important to recognize when pressure is excessive or unrealistic and, and, and learn to say, no, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And we've talked about this in other events. I've written a lot about this. Have alternate plans. There's just all kinds of things you can do to keep the pressure of the external factors from uh, causing a big problem. Our example that goes with that is this. The airline transport pilot, airline transport pilot, has purchased the vintage airplane earlier in the day and was en route to attend a family event later that afternoon. Track data for the accident flight indicated that the airplane was flying between 300 and 600 feet above ground level when it encountered a wind, I'm sorry, encountered a wind farm with several 400 foot tall wind turbines. The data showed that the airplane made a 90 degree course change, which was followed by a figure eight turn at varying altitudes between 800 and 1500 feet AGL. The airplane impacted terrain in a nose low, left wing down attitude. The 300 foot, uh, 300 foot long debris path and fragmentation of the airplane were consistent with a high speed impact. The intended route of flight was into an area of extensive instrument weather conditions consisting of low ceilings and reduced visibility. Weather stations near the accident site reported 400 to 600 foot AGL overcast ceilings and visibilities of one and a half to two and a half miles in mist. During the accident flight, there were active flight advisories for IFR flight and moderate icing conditions. The pilot had obtained three weather briefings before departing on the accident flight, all of which forecast that IFR conditions would exist along the planned route. The airplane was not equipped for IFR flight. The NTSB determined the probable cause as follows, quote, the pilot's continued visual flight into an area of known instrument meteorological conditions in an airplane not equipped for instrument flight, and his failure to maintain control of the airplane while maneuvering at low altitude, end quote. We refer to the, uh, we refer to the pressure felt in accidents such as this as internal fa uh, external factors, as we said. In this case, the pilot had just purchased this vintage airplane he was undoubtedly anxious to uh, attend the family event and show off his airplane. He flew into an area of IFR conditions. Even though he was instrument rated, the airplane wasn't equipped for instrument flight and he lost control. All right, moving on to our next one, lack of assertiveness. A personal minimums checklist can help prevent accidents caused by this. Another good tool is the FRAT, Flight Risk Assessment Tool. Um, I'm sorry, I'm still on pressure. <laughs> I got ahead of myself here. Look at what was coming up next. Don't talk about pressure. The personal minimums checklist can help prevent accidents caused by the external factors. Uh, you know, a FRAP, flight risk assessment tool. If you're not familiar with either of those, you can look them up online. You can find all kinds of information about them. Uh, good stuff. But we also want to have backup plans and alternate plans and uh, we just can't let the external factors run our lives and make sure that um, we don't fall victim to that. All right, lack of assertiveness. Here we go. This is our next topic. Being, being assertive is the ability to express opinions and needs in a positive and productive manner. Being assertive is not the same as being aggressive. Now, here are four elements of being assertive in a positive way. Get the person's attention. State the problem. Simply and without exaggeration, state the likely consequences. Provide solutions. And fourth, solicit feedback. It works, believe me. Now, for more information on this and a realistic example in general aviation, we have a YouTube video on the subject. To see that, uh, visit vectorsforsafety.com, navigate down to the videos section, and you'll find a link to it there. Uh, the title of that um, video is Being Effectively Assertive, and it takes us through a hypothetical example of um, a pilot um, needing to go somewhere and his friends are in the airplane and working down through the situation. Our associated accident for lack of assertiveness, this is kind of a long one here, uh, but it's important to get all the background to it, I think. Uh, this accident might have resulted in part uh, from the pilot's lack of assertiveness. The pilot uh, departed Willow Run Airport in Ypsilanti, Michigan, and was en route to Billings Logan International Airport in Billings, Montana. 
At 12.13, the pilot contacted a Lansing Automated Flight Service Station requesting a weather briefing for a flight from Willow Run to Portland International Airport, Portland, Oregon. He planned a route stop, uh, which was, but that was to be determined. The briefer advised the pilot to expect thunderstorms and rain shower activity in Michigan, moderate turbulence below 9,000 feet MSL, and icing conditions between 7,000 and 14,000 feet MSL. The briefer also described an area of thunderstorms extending from south of Milwaukee through the Chicago metropolitan area and extending almost to the Iowa border. The aircraft departed Willow Run at 1330 en route to Billings. The pilot contacted Lansing Approach at 1341 while climbing to 10,000 feet. At 1344, the Lansing Approach Controller asked if the pilot was equipped with weather radar. The pilot responded that he was not. The, pilot, the controller advised the pilot of weather ahead that might affect the aircraft's flight. The pilot requested vectors around the weather. Now, at 1345, the Lansing controller asked Grand Rapids Approach Control to see if they could provide further information on the extent and intensity of the precipitation. Grand Rapids Approach Control was equipped with the ASR-9 radar antenna that depicted six-level weather information in addition to its basic air traffic control display capabilities. The Lansing approach control was only equipped with the ASR-7 radar antenna that had limited weather capabilities. Grand Rapids controller was unable to assist at the moment due to workload, but said that he would call back. The Lansing controller then issued the pilot a 270 degree heading to avoid uh, the weather depicted on the controller's display. During this period, the aircraft climbed above its assigned altitude of 10,000 feet twice, at one instant uh, reaching 10,800 feet. At 1349, the pilot requested to climb to 11,000 feet because it was, quote, pretty bumpy in the clouds. The Lansing controller told the pilot to expect 12,000 feet, but to remain at 10,000 feet pending coordination with Cleveland Center. At 1350, the Lansing controller completed an automated handoff to the Cleveland Center, Jackson sector. The Lansing controller advised Cleveland Center, uh, the Jackson controller, that the airplane was on a 270 heading to avoid weather and relayed the pilot's request for 12,000 feet. At 1351, the Cleveland Center a controller cleared the aircraft to climb to 12,000 feet and instructed the pilot to proceed direct Milwaukee when able, but did not provide any information about radar observed weather ahead of the aircraft. At 1358 and 34 seconds, the pilot transmitted Center, this is uh, 707 Sierra Hotel. What do you show us in up here? The Chicago Center controller twice asked the pilot to repeat his message with no immediate response. The aircraft radar track data uh, was plotted on a weather radar chart that depicted areas of precipitation and their corresponding intensities. The plotted data showed the accident airplane flying into an area of level six precipitation at 12,000 feet prior to a rapid loss of altitude. Level six precipitation returns are characterized as extreme by the National Weather Service and are the highest intensity classification. At 13.59 and nine seconds, the pilot transmitted 707 Sierra Hotel SOS. I've got something wrong with the flight controls. At 13.59 and 16 seconds, the Chicago Center Controller responded, 707 Sierra Hotel, go ahead, let me know what you need. At 13.59 and 19 seconds, the sound of an open microphone was heard on the frequency for 12 seconds. At 13.59 and 40 seconds, the pilot said, Chicago Center 707 Sierra Hotel, we are going in, I can't maintain altitude. At 13.59 and 53 seconds, the Chicago Center Control responded, 707 Sierra Hotel, Roger, there's no aircraft between you and the airport for Grand Rapids. Grand Rapids is approximately 12 o'clock, 15 miles, and then there was no further contact with the aircraft. NTSB, probable cause, quote, the failure of Air Route Traffic Control Center controllers to provide adverse weather avoidance assistance as required by FAA directives, which led to the airplane's encounter with a thunderstorm and subsequent loss of control. Contributing to the accident was the pilot's decision to conduct flight into an area of known thunderstorms, end quote. 
Now, my thought is the pilot should have been more assertive with ATC when he encountered the weather and was unable to maintain altitude. A statement such as, need an immediate vector out of weather, would probably have been sufficient. Following the four steps that we listed uh, just a bit earlier, the pilot could have gotten attention by using the word pan or mayday. He could have stated the consequences and provided a solution by stating the weather was severe and that a vector out of it was needed. Now, no feedback should have been necessary other than to report on the conditions while being vectored. Always remember, who does ATC work for? They work for us, it's not the other way around. You may not be wearing a, a captain's cap with gold braid on it, but you're still the pilot in command, so don't be shy about exerting your authority as pilot in command and clearly stating what you need. I suppose we might be able to consider a lack of resources as a causal factor here. The pilot was attempting to fly in conditions conducive to heavy weather without weather avoidance equipment, um, and the controller also didn't have the equipment he needed to, to give it, but uh, primarily I, I would classify this as a lack of assertiveness. The pilot could have uh, could have just been a little more assertive as we went along. All right, before we go to the next one, uh, Lane, you have anything there we need to uh, talk about? Yeah, there's uh, two, uh, Gene, going back to the um, accident with the Cessna and the other plane. Uh, the mid-air collision? Yes, the, yeah. the communications. So William wanted to know if either plane, when, when did the accident happen and did either plane have ADSB? Um, neither airplane had ADSB because this happened um, before ADSB was around. This one, this one was uh, a little while ago. I don't know the exact uh, year that it happened, but uh, no ADSB on these, and that may help us in the future with these things. And then um, Gary Meister was saying he, he said it seems difficult to assign cause to some of these accidents, and some of these pilots exhibited questionable judgment and ADM skills for whatever reason. Um, yep, absolutely. Um, and often, you know, there's not one single cause for the accidents. I'm using these as an example of what might have been a causal factor in the accidents, just to kind of show us when we don't do um, certain things or we do do certain things, what the outcome might be. And if we are aware of some of these causal factors, just maybe it can cause us to uh, take a little bit different action in those in those cases but you're right it's 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 tough and the ntsb has to be very careful and what they say too like for example the one i said it on fatigue um i think everybody in the ntsb probably realized wow this guy was really fatigued he worked 16 hours and then he went out and flew um but how do you prove fatigue i mean if there's alcohol involved you got a blood alcohol level if there's drugs involved we got blood in tissue or in uh, or we got alcohol um the drugs in the tissue or the blood or whatever um, pilot is not instrument rated and continues flight and IFR conditions. Well, we got a cause. He shouldn't have done that. But a lot of them, it's 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 tougher to nail it down to one particular thing. And of course, ADM, aeronautical decision making. That's that's what it all comes down to. And um, if you want to learn more on that? Go to our um, decision making webinar on the the fourth of June. I think that'll be a good one. All right, we'll uh, we'll carry on here. Next one is norms. When I do a whole presentation on norms, I have a clip of uh, the old Cheers show. Norm walks into the bar and into Cheers, and everybody goes, norm. But anyway, in social psychology, the term is uh, normative social influence. We call it norms. Norms are unwritten rules and procedures followed by the majority of a group. Norms are part of the culture. They can be positive, they can be negative. But shortcuts can develop into negative norms over time. Most people want to fit in with a group. They might be reluctant to speak up when they're uncomfortable with a procedure or a practice. Norms, that was actually the cause of the DC-10 crash that we started, uh, that we showed in the beginning of the presentation where the engine pylon failed. The unapproved method of changing the en engine pylon involved uh, putting a, a forklift under the engine to support it, and that wasn't the uh, that wasn't the approved method, but they took a break. The hydraulics bled down the forklift, left the whole weight of the engine supported on the pylon without everything attached that should have been, and it caused uh, excessive stress on the pylon, and then a few weeks later, uh, the pylon failed. So that was actually norms because that method wasn't something that the, the technicians had done just once. 
it, they've been doing that for a long time. Somebody had come up with, oh, this is a lot faster than putting the supports under the under the engine that we that we normally do. This saves us a lot of time. We'll just do this, and at, over a period of of months or years, it became, oh, this is the way we do an engine. Uh, we, we work on the engines on the airplane and uh, became the normal way of doing it and eventually ended up as a bad deal. All right, here's some examples of norms that you might hear around the airport coffee shop. It's not necessary to use a checklist in a simple airplane. Ah, little frost won't make any difference. If I did all the maintenance the FAA says I should do, I couldn't afford to fly. Now, sometimes the local culture accepts and even encourages deviation from uh, safe practices. I had, I, um, I'll tell a quick story that I've, I told at least once before on one of these webinars. I did a flight review on one time from a little small airport, grass strip, uh, was a, definitely a good old boy operation. And the culture there was checklists are for sissies. If you're a good pilot, you don't need a checklist. Well, <laughs> I gave a flight review to a guy in a Cessna 172. There was a checklist in the airplane. He never pulled it out. I suggested he use the checklist, and he looked around to make sure nobody was watching, but he still didn't use the checklist. Um, so I was very familiar with 172s, and I, I had the checklist memorized. So I said, okay, well, we'll see what goes on here, and I ran through it in my head. And he did everything right except for one little thing. He never flipped the transponder into, uh, he never, he, he upped it in the standby mode. He never turned the transponder on. So we took off and of course, being the mean guy I am, I said, well, let's go and mess with the Class C airspace. We were right on the edge of Class C airspace. I said, um, get us through there. And he called and uh, didn't see him on radar. They shoot him a squat code and the whole bit. Couldn't see him on radar. And he's still, he's putting in a squat code and everything on the transponder, but he never, he never, never left the standby position with it. After he fooled around and fooled around and fooled around with it, um, I said, "Well, let's depart the Class C airspace." And we we went out. You know, we the clear the controller had cleared us to come in without the transponder. And um, I pointed to it and showed him what was going on. He said, "Oh, transponder! Well, that never killed anybody." I said, "No, but you know what? That transponder could have been the flaps. It could have been the trim. It could have been the fuel selector. Use the checklist." Anyway, um, here's our example. The pilot stated that during the takeoff roll, the airplane instantly rolled on a 45 degree angle to the left and crashed into a ravine on the side of the runway. Examination of the airframe, flight control system, and engine components revealed no evidence of pre-impact mechanical malfunction. During further examination, it was noted that the elevator trim was in the full nose-up position. When asked about the finding, the pilot stated that he had forgotten the trim in this position before and almost lost control during takeoff, before, but was able to continue flying the airplane. The airplane's before takeoff chest twist instructs the pilot to set pitch trim. NTSB probable cause, quote, the pilot's failure to maintain control of the airplane during takeoff contributing to the accident was the pilot's inadequate use of a checklist, end quote. This probably wasn't the first time the pilot had chosen not to use the checklist. Uh, and we just talked about an example of that, okay? The, um, the remedy, follow safe procedures and do the right thing. Be a safety evangelist. If you see something like this going on, everybody says, oh, don't use a checklist, or oh, don't worry about a little frost, uh, don't sample the fuel every time, whatever. Speak up, don't be bashful. Speak up and watch that assertiveness video and you'll learn how to do it. All right, our final factor is stress. There are different kinds of stress. There's chronic stress and there's acute stress. Today, we only have time to talk about acute stress. Uh, we can recognize stress uh, by feeling overwhelmed, jaw clenched, tight grip on something. Now, stress is a normal physical response to threatening events. A small amount of stress can improve performance. Excessive stress can lead to errors in building airplanes, maintaining airplanes, or flying airplanes. Learn to recognize stress and consciously try to relax when stress becomes noticeable. For our uh, example, amateur built TF-51D experimental airplane was substantially damaged when it impacted terrain while maneuvering near the Sky Ranch Airport, Sandy Valley, Nevada. The commercial pilot, 
sole occupant of the airplane was killed. According to multiple witnesses, uh, according to multiple witnesses located, uh, the pilot was unable to extend the left main landing gear after departure and conducted a series of low approaches over the runway while talking via radio to people located on the ground. After conducting six passes over the runway, the pilot was able to extend the left main landing gear about two thirds of the way down. The pilot continued to circle the airport within the traffic pattern as the witnesses located at the airport advised him to slip the airplane to the left, then the right. Witnesses reported that while the airplane was on downwind for runway 21 at an altitude of about 400 to 500 feet above the ground, the airplane appeared to enter a slip followed by an immediate roll to the right into a nose go attitude and descended into terrain. Witnesses further reported that it was the accident pilot's first flight in the airplane, which he had just recently purchased. The witnesses added that the radio communications with the pilot was hampered by the loudness of the engine. The NTSB determined the probable cause of the accident, quote, the pilot's failure to maintain adequate airspeed while maneuvering to land resulting in an aerodynamic stall. Contributing to the accident was the pilot's diverted attention while attempting to extend the landing gear. Now for the interesting part. Here's an excerpt from the Las Vegas Review Journal, a newspaper out there. Quote, Greg Jaspers was the name of this pilot. Quote, if Greg Jaspers was doing anything, it would be spending time with his family, fly fishing, or flying. The 52-year-old died in an air crash Sunday after more than 30 years as an Air Force test pilot. Jaspers was the pilot and only person on board an experimental airplane that crashed near Sandy Valley. He was flying a Bond TF-51D, a plane built from a kit in 2,000 feet that he had purchased about two weeks ago from the builder. The plane, a Thunder Mustang, is similar to but smaller than the P-51 Mustang, a World War II workhorse. Jaspers held the highest certificate offered by the Federal Aviation Administration. Rated as a multi-engine airline transport pilot, he had commercial privileges for helicopters and was certified to take off and land single-engine airplanes on sea and land, according to the FAA Registry for Airmen. Former Air Force sources and a fellow civilian pilot who knew him said he had flown a variety of warplanes, including the F-117A Nighthawk Stealth Jet and the F-16 Fighting Falcon. Jaspers, a retired colonel, had commanded the 410th Flight Test Squadron at Edwards Air Force Base, California. End quote, end of the newspaper article. Now, this pilot had obviously handled stressful situations in flight before. What might have been different this time? Maybe it was his own airplane. You know, harder to see something get wrecked that, that's yours. He didn't have an ejection seat. Maybe that was stressful. Maybe he was suffering from not just acute stress from this situation, but from chronic stress after retiring. That happens many times after somebody has a career and they, and they walk away from it. We don't know, but clearly the stress of the situation was a factor in the accident. You know, clearly he knew how to slip an airplane and clearly he, you know, he knew how to fly the airplane. Um, but apparently it got very stressful and uh, didn't end well. All right, so what have we done here? We've looked at 12 factors that can be applied to many aspects of life to help reduce errors and prevent accidents. We could argue all day about which factors best fit which various accidents, but that it really isn't important. The important thing is to recognize that these factors exist and to be aware of how they might influence our actions. Try to think about these factors as they might relate to our own flying. Got any other uh, questions there, Elaine? No, um, Glenn Goldman did point out, though, that on that last uh, picture, that it said that that was the actual aircraft, but he said the uh, picture of that TF-51D was actually a real Mustang, not a home-built scale replica, and is alive and well. So I just said, good, hmm. good. no, thanks. Okay, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, have to do a little more research on that one and see where that all came from. Okay, um, in that case, we can... Continue on. Did you know that Avempico offers a safety rewards program? 
Attendees at this event or any of my other events or those who take any safety-based educational courses can receive a percentage off their annual Avemco premium at the time of a quote or renewal. All you have to do is let Avemco know and they'll take care of the rest. So as we go down here, let me uh, turn my video back on here for a moment. There we go. I think. Yeah, there we are. Uh, please visit our website, vectorsforsafety.com. There are links there to videos and to online courses. All but one of the courses is free, and that course is uh, Human Factors Ground School, if you're into this stuff. Um, that one has a fee, but there's a, a link there. If you click the link, you get 50% uh, off um, on that course. You can also join my mailing list to receive uh, my free newsletter, Vectors for Safety. Um, all the several videos, including the... Um, the recent webinars that we've done are all posted on, you can get links to them from vectorsforsafety.com and they're all on uh, my YouTube uh, channel. All right. I also have some books available. You can search Amazon for uh, books by Gene Benson and they'll come up or there are links to them uh, from my personal website, which is genebenson.com. So all that being said, um, please remember, why, like your life depends on it.